Once again, I am thrilled that we are gonna be able to be together for the next few minutes to be able to dive into a significant passage from Christian scripture. One of the things that I am fond of saying and repeating on a regular basis around here is that the Bible, this big library of ancient writings, is complicated. This is an expansive library written by dozens of different people over the course of hundreds of years, miles apart, and it's all, you know, thousands of years old and pertaining to ancient history, at least on the first reading. And so reading and studying the Bible is a noble task, but it's not an easy one. It's not a task that should be gone through solo. It's something that's meant to be done together. In fact, as a whole, the Bible can be pretty intimidating and it can be difficult to unlock some of the Bible's meaning and some of the Bible's application in our lives. But one of the things I'm excited about in this series is that we are zeroing in on one specific, particular, and important section of the Bible that I think every Christian ought to familiarize themselves with. We are basing our study out of the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament portion of your Bible. And specifically, we're in a section of Matthew that we've come to call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and and seven. And I would be thrilled if you've got a Bible with you on your phone, or maybe you brought, you know, a hard copy with you to have you go ahead and be opening with us to Matthew chapter five. I, we put these verses up on the screen and we're going to do that again, but this is just one of those parts of the Bible that our, uh, we, our Bibles ought to fall open to this place because we have spent time in this particular portion of the scripture. This is Jesus's most extended recorded teaching that we have, and it's one of the most famous teachings that we know of from Jesus. But my favorite thing about the Sermon on the Mount is that this is where Jesus is spelling out clearly, precisely, and exactly what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I mean, if somebody came to me and said, Brock, I don't know anything about faith, I don't know anything about Jesus, but tell me, what are you talking about when you say follower of Jesus? Like, what is that? What does that look like? I would take them to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And on the other hand, if there was somebody who'd been around faith for a long time, somebody who was already a believer in Jesus, but they wanted to cut through all of the noise and just get down to the heart of what being a Christian looks like in real life, I would take them to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Because in these three chapters, Jesus is explaining his vision of the good life. He is, he is laying out his formula for a human life well lived. And contrary to all of the other visions that are out there, Jesus' vision is not all about just realizing your dreams and being true to yourself. But we hear that a lot, right? It's fascinating to me, and, and more than a little bit creepy, that we face this constant barrage, this constant stream of digital content that's telling us how we can achieve a good life, right? We're used to being targeted with ads. We've had that for a long time, of course. And so every time we drive by a billboard or every time we see a television commercial that's targeted at millions of people, we recognize instantly that strategy. We understand that they're trying to create an image of a life that would be just a little bit better if we were to purchase their product. We're used to that strategy. But nowadays, things have changed, and it's become so much more personalized. And so in, the, in this day and age now, with smartphones and technology companies tracking our demographics and our interests and our purchases and our whereabouts, they're predicting with amazing accuracy the specific dreams, the unique dreams, interests that might capture our attention, right? And so if you were to pay attention to the suggestions that websites and social media, you know, apps are making for you, you'll notice that they're recommending things for you that are totally different from the other people in your life. The suggestions that the internet is sending my way are totally different from the things that they're suggesting to my wife and to my son, but we're all being targeted by a customized sales pitch about the good life, 
my algorithm's showing me a lot of fishing gear and like tips for how to, you know, get your dad bod in shape, you know, and stuff like that. But you're seeing something completely different. You're seeing something that's based on who you are and where you've been and what you've bought and what might be next for you. And behind all of that, behind each company and each influencer, there's a suggestion about what the good life looks like, about what satisfaction looks like. And there's a suggestion about a life that's just a little bit better than the one you already have. Easier, more luxurious, more entertaining, more fulfilling. Because every advertisement, every website that says, we thought you might also like this product, every social media influencer is pitching us on a philosophy of what the good life looks like. And the reason I want you to pay attention to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is because I think that's what Jesus is doing here too. Jesus is laying out his vision, his philosophy of what a good human life actually looks like. But Jesus' vision is different because Jesus is working on a different plane. Jesus is thinking at a different level. Jesus is thinking about human purpose. Jesus is talking in terms of human design. Jesus knows what humans were made to do, made to want, made to need. Jesus knows what humans were made to be. And Jesus also knows that a misguided person can go through their whole life and achieve all sorts of goals and dreams and get to the end and discover that they've wasted their time chasing the wrong things. Jesus knows that you can be misguided in this life and chase the wrong vision. And so Jesus is casting this vision, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this vision and course for his followers. And it's unlike anything else we hear from any other source. Jesus isn't trying to get you to buy something. Jesus is not selling anything to us. Jesus is calling us to something. In fact, most people, most people who hear Jesus's vision for their life the first time are surprised by what Jesus's vision is. And some people are immediately Immediately disinterested when they hear about where Jesus wants to take his followers. But for the people who lean in, for the people who decide that they're going to give this vision a chance, for the people who allow Jesus to speak this entire vision into their lives, Jesus provides a whole new way of engaging with the world. And it turns out there's only certain types of people, only a few types of people who really appreciate what Jesus is offering. So the big question of this series is, what type of person are you? Are you the kind of person who can hear about the vision that Jesus is recommending, the philosophy that Jesus is laying out for his followers and say, that sounds better than anything I'm capable of coming up with on my own. And the way we're finding out is by studying the introduction to this sermon. The very few first few verses of Matthew chapter 5, we call it a section, uh, we call it the Beatitudes or the Blessings. And it's this series of statements that Jesus makes about who in this life is really fortunate, really to be envied. And the last couple of weeks, as we've looked at the beginning of this list, we've come across some surprises already, and there are more surprises in store, including the two Beatitudes we're reading together today. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 4, I want you to listen to these two brief sentences that Jesus shared on that day. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And then he said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, if you heard the sermon from last week, you may remember that the word that we translate blessed here, it means something like fortunate or maybe even lucky. You could rephrase these two verses to say, lucky are the people who mourn or fortunate are the people who are meek. But that doesn't sound like anything that we've heard anywhere else, does it? That doesn't sound like any other philosophy that is ever pitched out to us about the good life. I, I'm somebody who's in a unique position to spend maybe more time than the average person around grieving folks, 
right? I mean, I, I preach a handful of, of uh, funerals every year. And when I was taught about how to prepare a funeral, I was taught to go spend time with the family and listen to stories and listen to memories of the life that we are commemorating. And so there have been some times where I have sat in some pretty somber rooms, some moments when I have sat with some heartbroken people. Some of, some of them are here in this room. And I have listened to these stories and we've processed this loss together. But I've got to admit to you, there's never been a time when I was sitting in one of those rooms and I thought, boy, these people are lucky to be going through this. Boy, these people are blessed. You know, like that's, that's never crossed my mind. A few years ago, I was serving as a chaplain at a local hospital here, and I, I was in the ER one night when a, a young man in his 30s was brought in. It was Valentine's Day, and he'd been out on a date with his wife and suddenly had just become unresponsive at the table. And the doctors and the nurses worked on him and tried everything they could, but he didn't make it. And I was there when they, they came and they broke the news to his young wife and I watched and listened as she shook her head in disbelief and screamed in despair and nobody in the ER that night would have said, boy, that lady's lucky. That lady's fortunate. None of us wanted to be in her shoes and we didn't wish her situation on anybody. We were all heartbroken with her. We were heartbroken for her. And so when Jesus says, blessed, fortunate are those who mourn, it might strike you as uninformed, might even strike you as insensitive for Jesus to say that. I think that might be how it kind of struck some of the people who were listening to it when he said it in person. Jesus had this crowd of people who were following him. Some of them were disciples that he had invited to come and be his traveling apprentices and to learn from him. But there were also crowds of people who were around who were just folks that were down and out. Many of them had family members and friends who were ill, diseased, paralyzed, possessed, struggling with some of the most challenging struggles that their culture was aware of. And they had come to Jesus hoping that Jesus might heal them, heal somebody in their family. These were people who knew suffering. They knew hardship. And there was such primitive and limited medical treatment available to them in those days that they... Nobody in society thought, boy, that family's lucky. That family's lucky to be going through that kind of a trial, to be going through that kind of difficulty. And they didn't think of themselves as lucky either. But the, we've got to read this passage well because Jesus is not being naive and Jesus is not being cruel. In fact, Jesus is not hoping that all of his disciples would just perpetually be sad. This is not what Jesus is after. I don't believe Jesus is saying that people are blessed because they are mourning. I believe Jesus is describing the kind of person who has God's attention. Jesus is describing the kind of person to which God's face turns and God draws near and sometimes God is right next to them and they don't even realize it. Jesus is describing the kind of person who, whether they know it or not, is fortunate because their situation has drawn God's heart so close to them. People who are grieving, people who are mourning, they may be in the best position to connect with the God who loves them so, and to understand the world the way God sees the world. You see, the thing is, grief comes from a deep place inside of us, right? And grief, when it wells up inside of us, it happens in reaction, in response to something tragic that's happened in our world. Grief wells up inside of us to say, something is broken. Something's messed up about this situation. When we're grieving, we're announcing to the world that something happened that should not have happened. I like the way that Pastor Glenn Packiam describes it in his book. He says, to mourn is to protest. It's to say, this should not be. He says, we mourn in the face of tragedies. We mourn when we experience loss. And on these occasions when we mourn, when we protest, these are the occasions when from the depths of our soul we cry out, this is not supposed to happen. That young man was not supposed to die in the ER. We're protesting. And he says, and we're right to protest. To mourn is to protest. 
And to protest is to give witness to a better reality. It's a sign in our souls that we are in on God's secret. He says God's secret is this, that all is not as God intends. This isn't quite the world God made. All is not the way it should be. Sin is at work. Evil has infested the cosmos. When we're grieving, we are acknowledging with God that something is messed up here. I believe mourning is the way that we lodge our complaint about the state of things in the world because it's in our grief that we give the world a review and we say, no, zero stars. I do not recommend it. This thing is messed up. And the mourners, the people who are grieving, those are the people who have come face to face with their powerlessness. They have come into a situation where they have realized, I would throw all of my resources, all of my energy, all of my time, all of my money, all of my expertise. I would give it everything I have to fix this, and I still couldn't fix it. That's what mourning does to you. Mourning helps you acknowledge that at some point, your power is limited. And mourners are people who've suffered because try as they might, they couldn't do anything to avoid or delay or postpone a bad outcome. Mourning is the way that we air our grievances to the manager of this place. Mourning is how we give the manager a piece of our mind and talk about how things are going around here and could be a lot better. And we're mourning because we see the problems with the world, the unfairness, the injustice, and we simply can't accept that this is the way things have to be. And in this beatitude, in this blessing, Jesus says, me too. Jesus says, I get it. I agree. When Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, he's announcing that our complaints are being heard and they're being acted on. We just sang this lyric a few minutes ago that said, you turn mourning into dancing. Remember? This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what Jesus is promising for us, that there's something that's being done to address the problems that our mourning, our grief, our complaint has not fallen on deaf ears and help is on the way. And that's the part that comes as the big surprise because the people who listened to Jesus say this, the people who heard these beatitudes in person the first time, they felt like they were totally shut out of connection to God. They had been told, most of them had felt left out by religion, left behind. They'd been told that they didn't measure up. They'd been told that their problems were their fault because of their sin. They had been told that God had distanced himself from them. Culture had told them that they were getting what they deserved. And here's Jesus laying out a new vision of a way to look at things and saying, I see you. God sees you. And he's saying this to people who'd never heard that before, people who felt powerless, people who felt hopeless. And the surprising thing is that sometimes it's our mourning that causes us to look to God for help. Sometimes it's our dissatisfaction with the way things are that causes us to look outside of ourselves and look to God for aid. Sometimes our grief is what draws us to our creator. So grief is not this indicator that God has abandoned us. Grief is not some, something that says that we are the problem. Grief is a trigger that actually pushes us toward the one who can do something about it. And we discover when we draw close to God, when we fix our attention on God, we discover that God is doing something, that God is working and carrying out his purposes until such a time as his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in the powerlessness of grief, in the hopelessness of mourning that we discover God is at work fixing what's broken and that's the blessing Jesus was announcing to these people. But then he followed that up with a second one. The other blessing that we read together this morning. Jesus also said, blessed 
are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And this blessing is related to that first one, but they're not exactly the same. Meek people, the meek are people who have a reason to lodge a complaint because they've been mistreated. He's not just talking about people that are quiet. He's not just talking about people that are introverted or shy. He's talking about people who have suffered and who have been humbled. And he's talking to every Israelite in the time of Jesus. You see, since Israel was under the control of the Roman Empire at that time, all of the Israelites were living under oppression. They had no agency. They had no power of their own. When they were mistreated by a Roman soldier, they had no recourse. When they were overtaxed by a Roman tax collector, there was nothing that they could do about it. In fact, I want to read you a couple of quotes from one of the most important books I've read in the last few years, Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited, And he describes first century Israel this way. He says, Rome was the enemy. Rome symbolized total frustration. Rome was the great barrier to peace of mind. And Rome was everywhere. Like there wasn't any place that the Israelites could turn and forget about it. This was constantly their plight, was that they were under the oppression. They were under the control of the Roman Empire. And he goes on to say this. He says, in a society in which certain people or groups have advantages over others by virtue of economic or social or political power, he says, in that kind of society where certain people have dead weight advantages over others, over people who are essentially without power, he says, the people who are disadvantaged, the ones who are on the bottom rung of the ladder, they know that they can't fight back. They can't fight back effectively and they can't protect themselves and they can't demand protection from their persecutors because any conflict that they create, any insult that they dish out, any frustration that they reveal might bring down upon their head the full weight of physical violence. He says, when you're at the bottom, when you're in a society like the Israelites were in the first century and they were just subject to whatever the whims of the Roman Empire were, when you're in that kind of situation and you're the one who has no power, he says, it's a desperate situation because there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. And Jesus was surrounded by people who were oppressed. Jesus was surrounded by people who felt powerless. And many of them were tempted all the time to try to take matters into their own hands. They were going to use subversive tactics and try to get revenge on their persecutors. And so among the Israelites, there's these groups of zealots and rebels and different leaders who would occasionally start some uprising of violence, some, you know, revolt against the Romans. But the action was always short-lived because the Romans were simply too powerful. And that's the society, that's the climate, the political climate that Jesus lived in. He's speaking to people who wanted a way out of their predicament, people who might be tempted to choose violence and rebellion. And into that climate, Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who trust God with their future rather than taking things into their own hands. And he says, and they will inherit the earth, or some translations may say they will inherit the land, which is almost definitely a reference to the promised land that the Israelites felt the Romans had taken away from them. And when I think about that whole situation, I think, boy, that's different than what we're experiencing, isn't it? Our situation's a whole lot different. We don't, I mean, America has more in common with ancient Rome than we have in common with ancient Israel. We don't live under the oppressive thumb of an occupying empire that dictates every move, every aspect of our lives. More than almost any culture in human history, we are people who get to choose our path and make our decisions for ourselves, but we still know what it's like to be mistreated, don't we? We still know what it's like to feel overlooked, to feel taken advantage of, to feel ignored. We know what that feels like, and when that happens, There's always a choice that we're faced with. There's always a decision to be made. How are we going to respond? How do we respond when someone else treats us harshly? 
when someone else treats us offensively? How do we respond? And one option is to take matters into our own hands, to get riled up and look for a way to get ahead, to get back at them, to get even. But Jesus is saying something about the good life when he says, blessed are the meek. He's telling us that those who trust in God, those who put their hope in God's timing, those who count on God's justice will see God's promises come true. And that sounds good, but it doesn't come naturally, does it? It doesn't come naturally to trust in that. But Jesus' vision for the good life is not about doing what comes naturally. It's about doing what comes supernaturally. Jesus is asking us to trust in God even when our instincts tell us that we can only count on ourselves. Jesus is laying out a vision of trusting God even when our culture says that doesn't work. Jesus is laying out a philosophy for the good life that says even when your circumstances make you feel isolated and panicked and alone, you can trust in God. Jesus is telling us, and he was telling those people 2,000 years ago, hope has arrived. Hope is on the scene. Your complaints, your, your need has been heard. And the challenge that faces each one of us is that there's going to be times when we're tempted to think, no, nah, it's not going to work this time. There's going to be times because of the circumstances we face and the voices that are speaking into our lives and the fears that are welling up inside of us. There's going to be times when we think, I'm in this all by myself. There's going to be times when our grief gets so overwhelming that we start to wonder if God's even out there or if God even cares. There's going to be times when we're suffering mistreatment, when we've been overlooked and offended and neglected, and we're going to wonder if God has forgotten all about us or if God has abandoned us. There are going to be times along this journey when we're going to feel powerless and we're going to feel hopeless. And the temptation in that moment is to seize any kind of power and influence and control that we can. The temptation in that moment is to do anything we can to fight for ourselves, to take matters into our own hands. In fact, there are going to be Christians and there are going to be churches who are going to tell you that grasping for power is what Christians should do. There are going to be Christians and there are going to be churches. In fact, there's a bunch of them in our community who are going to tell you that Christians ought to strive to gain power, to latch on to control, to be able to force their vision on everybody else. There are going to be Christians who are going to tell you that the way of Christ is to make everybody else do things Christ's way. And here's Jesus saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones who mourn. Blessed are the ones who are meek. And he never says, blessed are the ones who are in control. Blessed are the ones who take matters into their own hands. Quite the opposite. Jesus is calling us to a life of giving up control so that God can receive all of the credit for the things that go right. A few years ago, there was a translation of the Bible that was published by a, an influential minister named Eugene Peterson. The translation is called The Message, and rather than a word-for-word -word translation from the original Greek, it's more of a thought-for-thought -thought idea. It's a paraphrase of the Scripture, and it can be really helpful to help, to help you kind of just see the Scripture in a new light sometimes. And I want to read to you just these two sentences, these two verses, the same Beatitudes that we just read from our New International Version a little bit ago. But I want to read, to, read them to you in the paraphrase that Eugene Peterson wrote. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 says, You're blessed when you feel like you've lost what's most dear to you. Because then, only then, can you be embraced by the one 
who is most dear to you. And then in the next verse it says, you're blessed, you're fortunate, you're lucky when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. See, here's the thing. Jesus isn't trying to sell you anything. When Jesus casts this vision in Matthew 5 through 7, he's not trying to sell you anything like all of the other influencers and companies out there, but Jesus is trying to give you access to that which can't be bought. It's a life bigger than yours. It's a vision and a purpose bigger than yourself. It's a life that has peace that you can't explain any other way than to say that it was given to you supernaturally. Jesus is casting a vision for a life that results in joy and hope and gentleness and kindness. And we do not know the path to that life apart from Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is calling us to be people who give up control people who trust ourselves to God's care and God's direction and God's leading, even when we don't understand what's next. You know, every week in our services, we participate in this little ceremonial meal. We're going to do it in a few minutes. It's called the Lord's Supper. It's something small. If you've never done this before, there's nothing magic about the, the elements. It, it's a little piece of cracker and a little cup of grape juice. Simple stuff. But every week we participate in this meal together. We, we take this bread, we drink this cup so that we can remember the love, the sacrifice, the hospitality, the gift of Jesus. It reminds us of the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples right before he went to the cross. And we remember the, we remember the, the violence that was inflicted on Jesus. We remember the suffering. We remember the submission. We remember all of those things. But let us not forget that when Jesus instituted this meal, when he started this for the first time, when he passed that bread around the table and then passed that cup around the table, he was telling these people, telling his followers, I would rather submit my life to God's care than to do this my own way. He was telling his followers, God can be trusted. And submission to others, love for others, gentleness, that's the way to the good life. And because Jesus did that, because Jesus submitted himself to God's plan, even to the point of death. God resurrected him into a life that was better than anything that could otherwise be imagined and resurrected him as a promise of resurrection for everybody else who would follow his lead.